الأمور محدثاتها وكل محدثة بدعة وكل بدعة ضلالة وكل ضلالة في النار ثم أما بعد ما ديروا سمتي بودن السيسر السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته As announced in today's lecture or today's talk, we want to go over a topic suggested to us by some of the brothers in the community, which is a Muslim household and challenges that a Muslim family faces. Now this can be challenges we face in our daily lives. It can be challenges that we face specifically in the US or in a non-Muslim country. It could be challenges that we face even in Muslim countries because every household will always have problems and will always have challenges and will always have issues and differences and challenges. Now the question, Jazakallah khairan, the question that we ask is what are those challenges and how do we overcome it? A Muslim household in order for a Muslim household to be a Muslim household is if the household in itself or the family is built upon taqwa and built upon Islam and built upon deen and the right guidance. Baytun usis ala taqwa min Allah. This is where the challenges first begin. It's because sometimes or a lot of times the house is not built on Islamic foundations. It's not built on Islamic principles. It's not built upon taqwa. That's why the household tends to fall apart. Sometimes in the early stages of the marriage, sometimes in the middle stages when kids come along, sometimes down the road when the kids are even grown. And you find a lot of times that, you know, households break apart. Even after the kids are broken, you know, are grown, the household tends to fall apart. We have kids in that household that face challenges where they themselves, they, you know, have doubts in Islam. Some of them are disrespectful to the parents. Some of them are, you know, don't treat the, the, you know, their, their, their siblings properly. Some of them are bad in school, some of them, you know, there's so many different challenges that people face in a household. We said the first, the first um, step is to build the family upon Islamic principles, upon Islamic guidance, upon taqwa of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You cannot, as a parent, expect your children to be raised as righteous kids if you, the parents, are not righteous and are not the proper, the proper role models for them. You find a lot of families, a lot of parents, they sit here and they expect their kids to be the best of the best. But they themselves, they're not really doing much. They're not achieving and accomplishing much. There, you know, there's so much that they need to work in, you know, within themselves to be the right role models. You find, you know, in the seerah of our beloved Prophet Wasallam, he was the best role model for his children to the point where even Fatima, and I always focus on this aspect, Fatima Ta'ala Anha, after the death of the Prophet Wasallam. She talks about the moment where she entered into the house of Aisha and seeing her father and Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam sick laying in bed on his deathbed about to die. And what was the first thing that she mentioned? She said that she cried and it hurt her because she was so accustomed to every time she walked into the house the Prophet والسلام, and Nabi والسلام, would get up from his chair and let Fatima sit in his spot and he would kiss her on the forehead. Now imagine, this is our Nabi والسلام. That's how he taught and raised his daughter. 
that it stuck in her head, that it was something that she couldn't forget. It was a habit that she was accustomed to, that she was well respected by her father and well treated by her father. It is, it, Allah, it breaks my heart to see parents and kids who really, when they are talking or describing their parents, it's as if they're describing an enemy or describing someone that they are terrified from. Fadl al Sheikh. That are terrified. A child should never, ever be afraid of his parents. Respect, yes, that's needed. But fear, to the point where you look at your father as someone that you are afraid of and afraid to interact with, is that's not a relationship, a bond that you want to build your family upon. Yes, enforcing respect is important, but not fear. Look at the Quran. Two amazing examples, and of course there are plenty of them, but I'll mention two great examples. A relationship between a father who is Abu al-Anbiya, Ibrahim alayhi salam, with his son Ismail. Ibrahim was in his 90s. Ismail was a young child who just started walking, who used to go with his father everywhere. And they had such a close bond that Ibrahim started having so much love for his son Ismail that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala seen that Ibrahim's love for Allah has kind of shifted a little bit. And some of it went to his son. That Allah wanted to redirect that love to him subhanahu wa ta'ala. So he let Ibrahim see continuously in his dream over and over and over again that he is slaughtering his son. And he goes to Ismail. قَالَ يَا بُنِيَّ إِنِّي أَرَى I see, أَرَى means I see continuously. I'm having a sequence of dreams. What is the sequence of dreams that I'm seeing? I am seeing me slaughtering you or sacrificing you. Now look at the adab of the mukhataba between the father and the son. Ibrahim first says, Ya Bunaya, inni aratil malam. It's a very soft and gentle way to call upon your son. He says, Hey, I've noticed that I've been dreaming continuously, that I am sacrificing you. And we notice, and we know that in the Quran, that yeah, in, in, uh, for, for Prophet Ali Muslims, the ru'ya that, that, that they see is a wahi from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Ibrahim knew it. Ismail also understood it. Qala ya abati, ma ajmal had nida. Oh my father. Ya abati, if ma tu'mar, do as you are commanded to do. Satajiduni insha'Allah min as sabirin. You will find me insha'Allah amongst those who are patient and sabirin. You cannot expect your son or your daughter to just be at the سَمِعْنَا وَطَعْنَا stage always saying, yes, I obey, yes, I obey. If you are not speaking with him or her the same way, then Ibrahim a.s. spoke to his son. Yusuf a.s. Yusuf a.s. He goes to his father because of the connection and the bond that they built. We're trying to avoid challenges and challenges will always come. But these challenges can only be overcome if the family stands together and faces those challenges together as a family. A lot of times families have these challenges and these stresses that happen and everybody's going in circles and not knowing how to handle it and how to process it. But a family, they're connected, they stay together. Now by the way, this is not going to be a full lecture. How it's going to be, it's going to be a dialogue in a little bit between me and Abdullah about different challenges. That's why he's sitting with me right now. But I wanted to give a small introduction while he settles down. Yusuf goes to his father and says, Ya abati, inni ra'aytu. And ra'aytu and ara are different. Ara is something that he sees continuously. Ra'aytu is one time. I've seen in my dream. 
Now it's the son telling the father about a dream, not the vice versa. He says, I have seen in my dream 11 planets. And the moon and the sun, I've seen them prostrate to me. This whom li sajideen, ra'ytum li sajideen, ra'ytum li sajideen. The father says, Ya Bunaya, la tahsus ruyaka ala ikhwatika fi akidu laka kayda. Inna shaytana lil insani aduun mubin. Do not tell the story to your brothers. Why? Because shaytan may come between you and cause these types of challenges, which is hasid. And I'm going to talk about that in a little bit. Hasid and hiq, envy, that may occur between brothers, that may occur also between a father and a son, or a son and a father, a, a, a mother and a son, or, or a mother and a, 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 and a daughter. Jealousy and envy may happen between any number of people in the household. Abdulillah, salam alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Thank you for being here with me today. What you say? Abdullah always loves the term challenges. And a lot of the talks that we go through are challenges between youth challenges or Muslim challenges. And it's, I like it. I'm not criticizing it. I like it because life is filled with challenges. And life throws curveballs at us all the time. People react to those challenges in, in, in different ways and forms. Some people handle those challenges successfully. Others don't. Now, what are the, some of the challenges that yeah, Abdullah or Abdullah Abu Sa'id that Muslim families face, whether it's challenges in general or challenges within the U.S.? Well, Abdullah I would like to focus on challenges in the U.S. Okay. Uh, because it's it's uh, if we can help by bringing in awareness, you know, to our challenges here. You know, and we can address them hopefully that later on the the family will set an example for families that actually are living in the Muslim countries. Right now with the social media, everything became very challenging to everyone. And subhanAllah as of you know uh, you know the challenges that the Muslim community is facing, you know, how when they migrate or even that the one that they are born in this country they find themselves between two worlds. The Islamic world and this materialistic world, you know, especially they've been driven by commercial, by status symbol, by all these things. And sometimes we feel if we don't follow this, we're going to deprive ourselves, our children from this. And this process, we're going back and forth, we get to sometimes lose our deen, lose our families and lose our children. The other things also that I believe that our community are not well vested in themselves and their community as a Muslim, how to keep the community together, how to face our challenges together, how to help our children grow together and become successful in our adopted country or mother country who were born here, the United States of America. And I think it's extremely important. We have the gift of Islam, and if we don't use it properly, we, we intend in the process of the journey of this life, I might hold on to it, you might hold on to it, yeah. but the problem is, our children might not. And, and this is extremely dangerous as we see today, many invasion to the Muslim mind, to the Muslim, you know, how he thinks, because a lot of time, Battles are not taken, the battlefield is taken to in the invasion of, of the Muslim mind. Uh, and Muslim mind, if it's not sound, you know, tend to fail in their lives, you know. And I think it's extremely important that, that, that we, we go back and, and view how we deal with things. And the reason this subject is dear to me, I have seen high divorces in our community. Uh, there is domestic violence, there is children abuse. Um, and subhanAllah, we tend to cover up this thing up, which will create a problem in the long run for us. Either our children will, will run when we turn 18, they just leave, you know, their family, the community, because they feel that no justice was done to them, nobody heard them. Or our sisters will just leave and drop off their hijab and, 
and say, what is this community that I belong to, the family I belong to, they never stood on my side. And subhanAllah, these are challenges we are facing, but you know, at the end of the day, how could we bring this thing together and, and start fixing our affairs within ourselves, within our communities? Because subhanAllah, if we are not taking this thing seriously, and we only focus about you know, getting good education, uh, good business, beautiful house that is worth a million, two million, three million. I know people who bought houses for five million dollars, they are five thousand square feet, they are husband and wife and two children. And if I ask him to bring your children to the masjid, he would just look at me like I'm crazy. And then when challenges, you know, become very difficult for them, and then when they return to Islam, it becomes very difficult to bring their children and talk to them because they have no connection to the community, no to Islam. And I think that, uh, in my humble opinion, when talking about challenges, first of all, you know, also our organization, I believe that they fail plenty, you know, because they focus on other issues that they were not important first to us as a Muslim in America, and they focus on other things overseas. We cannot change what's going on overseas. We can make dua, we can make opinion, we can lobby in this, but we cannot, we cannot change it, you know, the way how our situation is today. And if we look at the Dasir of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he was in Mecca, how he dealt with the situation, when he migrated to Medina, how he dealt with the situation. And I feel that our community also became too negative. We're only bringing negative attitude, we belittle each other, we, we, we are not trusting each other, we're not supporting each other, we're not giving value to each other, we're not giving value to the relationship and Allah for Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala. We'll sit in a parking lot with the masjid and complain about the masjid that we belong to. Or complain by the individual who they are running the masjid. This individual, I just remember the community. You're going to make mistakes. But the love for them and, and the trust for them will make them, you know, you know, better themselves and fix the affairs that are going to benefit them and the community. But I believe starting something wrong, that's what causes a lot of the challenges that I see in the family. The first thing that I want to say, how do we start our marriages? Is it to please Allah? Or is it you look at that certain expectation that, you know, that you know you're not going to achieve them. You want this long list in the man or the long list in the husband, but you have always the dean fits into this relationship when you began your marriage, you know. So if you started, you know, the right way, to please Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, I think, you know, بِإِذْنِ your challenges become, you know, easy to handle. You know, as we know, the dunya is, is full of challenges as part of our life because it's not our destination. You know, And I give you the, you know, to touch up. So, hey, first and foremost, uh, I think you've touched upon a few challenges um, here in the U.S. that families face. Um, and of course, there's plenty more. There's so many more challenges that I can, I would say there are countless at this point. There's challenges also that come up. And inshallah, you know, a topic like this needs to be, you know, discussed within probably four to five sessions because of the many challenges. Amongst them is the LGBT community and how we have some of our Muslim youth who are converting to, you know, or, or at least agreeing with, you know, LGBT. You have youth that are losing faith in Islam or in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. They don't even know what Islam really is. You know, you have, um, and, and, and like I said, there's just, there, there are just so many of them, whether they're doing drugs, whether it's pornography, whether it's addictions to, to smoking and drinking, wanting to try different things. And I think all this comes back to one thing, and that is that the house has not been built, or as you mentioned, the marriage has not been built upon the Islamic foundation. It's, it's very critical and it's, it's sad that today when we talk about these topics, Ya Said, people tend to look at us, as you mentioned, like we're, we're, we're so old school, like you guys are still talking to You're, you're crazy. Yeah, you're still talking about Islam, <laughs> so and you're talking about this, and you're <laughs> yes. talking about yes. that. You know, what, when are you guys going to talk about different topics, about our kids' education, being successful? I remember once upon a time, there was a, 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 a um, uh, it was not a couple of years ago, there was a sheikh, subhanAllah, in, um, in Sudan who was teaching Bukhari in the masjid. And there was this person that, he's Muslim, 
But, you know, he's one of those people that have some type of resentment resentment and animosity towards Islam. So he comes to the masjid and tells the imam in front of the students, he said, man, you know, the Americans and the Europeans and the, and the Chinese and the Russians, all those non-Muslims, they went to the moon and back. And you're sitting here teaching Bukhari to teach people about Islam? And the sheikh said, let me ask you a question. He was like, forget me. Have you taught Bukhari before? He said, no. He said, have you went to the moon and back before? He said, no. <laughs> he said, well, you haven't done either of the two, but you're sitting here talking. For people right now, that yeah, I understand in the eyes of a lot of people, what we are talking about now has become cliche. You've heard it from probably 90 different imams in different forms. We will still continue to talk about these topics because it's a continuous disease that's happening. When COVID happened for a year and a half, you've had CNN and Dr. Fauci and Sanjay Gupta and all these doctors from the CDC and the World Health Organization and so many more that talked about it every single day for almost a year long or probably more than a year. COVID, yes, yes, absolutely. A disease that is affecting World, the entire world that just stopped the entire world and every news outlet talked about it and had on the side of the screen the amount of people that are infected daily people that died from it you know the world who you know which state or which city or which country is affected the most because it was affecting everybody and nobody once sat there and said why you guys keep talking about this maybe they have maybe they haven't but because it was a real disease and an infection that was causing people's lives, they felt the need to talk about it every single day, over and over and over again, to warn people how to avoid it. Right now, in these challenges, we're not talking just about matter of life and death. We're talking about families falling apart. We're talking about kids leaving Islam. We're talking about Jannah and Nar. That is why this topic will be talked about and repeated in different ways and forms over and over and over again because the disease is spreading. The challenges are spreading. We are getting phone calls. Abdullah got a phone call three, four weeks ago about a family, a sister or a brother. I'm, I don't know the, the, the gender. I'm not going to mention the gender, but one gender is trying to be another gender. And I know you understand what I'm trying to say, but it's... It happens in our communities where Muslim youth from one gender wants to hop onto the next gender. And you tell me why are you still at the masjid talking about these topics? Because, because of how serious these matters are. Because of how they are affecting not only that individual's life, but the entire household. And, uh, can I cut you off? Please. And, and uh, Jazakallah uh, Khairan, Sheikh Yasser, for mentioning that. You know, I mean, I think the problem that we are facing when we start a family, even if it starts on the right foot, as, as a Muslim family, you know, with the right thing, you know, creating, a, getting to this marriage to please Allah, which is a lot of it doesn't happen in our communities. We marry because of culture, we marry because of status, we marry because we're attracted. And that doesn't mean that this thing are not important, don't take me wrong. But what I'm saying is, there is a foundation is set by Allah and His beloved Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. I think this is the month of I believe uh, it's been called domestic violence month, and there is many months that have you know, uh, uh, you know child protective you know because they've been abused. You know, Subhanallah, we as Muslims should not have these issues. Should we get to divorce? You can. But when you're in the household, you know, there is violence and the kids are witnessing that. What do you expect? And the community is not addressing it. So this sister, you know, where should she go to at the end of the day? The, you know, when we say, why are you going to non-Muslim? Because, you know, a lot of the had failed to address the concern. We have to address this current taken seriously because when the divorce happened, you have a devastation of a family. You have a single mother right now. Sometimes they get thrown into a shelter. You know, the father leaves the country. You have these kids. And the community come and give the support to the best of their ability. And sometimes our resources are limited. 
okay? And this is, you know, something that we need to look into. Now, another thing is, you know, we, not, not all of us can afford an Islamic school, which is $800,000 a month, you have three kids. I understand that. But we have other avenues. You can do homeschooling, you have very educated sisters that are sitting home, you can bring them with their children, you run larger spaces, you know, the programs from some areas are free, you give some, the sister some income, and you know, just, you know, her back, even if she doesn't need the money, her husband is worth a lot of sister, you give it to them just to, whatever it might be, they can come and, and, and teach our children that they are from the same religion. Nobody wants to listen to solutions. We come in with problems, and we are not action-oriented community that I feel. We became so negative that everything becomes negative, and we just come sometimes, we just want to complain. You have the right to speak when things are wrong, but also we can help each other find a solution. When we throw our kids to a public school, and we shine as a message, and many messages are not talking about this. And there is, the, uh, the as you mentioned, the LGBT, community are pushing certain things to our kids. And our kids feel that they have no program in the message, they have no program in the community, everything is haram. What is the alternative when we are saying haram to certain behaviors? We have to come up with alternative. We have to come up with solution. We can do day camps. We can take our kids, uh, you know, uh, hiking. Uh, we can do sport for our, for our girls. You know, we have sisters that have, that do sports from many sports. We can, create activities and we have the means and how. Don't tell me the Muslim community is poor. They are not, we are not a poor community. This is not acceptable in the Census Bureau. You can go and look at the, 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 the survey and that's been done and the, uh, the information has been collected. When our children go again and they, you know, they are confused, they are too shy to come to their parents, which I understand that because we're going to get devastated, okay? But again, she, they cannot go to the masjid and address the imam. And this is a problem. If, if any member of the community have fell into anything that is haram, either be drinking, either be zina, either be whatever, might be, you should be able to go to the masjid and talk to that imam with confidence and that imam have the eye of mercy to talk to them. You know, not that we come, we come over to the short about you need haram, you're not allowed to come to the masjid. This is not the behavior of the Prophet When you're talking about celebrating the Prophet that's how we celebrate the Prophet every day in our lives and how we deal with situation, how we approach it because in his sunnah we have everything in our lives. He was the most influential person that ever walked the earth and he still is. So I urge my brothers and sisters in, in, that they are active in the community you know, to, to start taking these things seriously and stop, you know, if there is an issue that you see in the community Study it if you have the knowledge, you know, bring a plan for it and bring it forward. If this community center, this message does not take it, you're going to find people who, who will take it and invest in it as long as the intention is just to please Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So which challenge should we go over today? Let's choose one challenge for tonight to go over so that we don't... Sure, because sure. Because there's plenty of them and we, we have a, a very limited time frame. So let's choose a challenge that I we think, can I think what is the foundation that we need to have? First of all, we have to build a foundation. The foundation for our family it is a marriage. Okay? And our marriages face challenges. Okay? How, you know, we keep our marriages together. How we solve marriages problem. How to result into violence to these large expenses in courts, everybody drag everybody through the mud, you know, destroying each other emotion. What is this? Ashraf Nabi Ma'aru Farik Wa Nabi Hassan. This is a clear, again, foundation for Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala, how we should, you know, deal with divorce. So, I mean, the, the, the seriousness of the issue is we are not working hard to keep our families together. You know, yes, you know, sometimes, you know, the father will blame the, the mother, or the mother blame the father for the kids and their behavior. Uh, you know, this is another subject and we need that, but how, for me, that first we come into the marriage, what is the, 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 the personality we come in, what is the attitude we come into it, what am I, am I committed to it or not, what am I willing to invest, what am I willing to compromise, what am I willing to, 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 to be there, you know, uh, for my family, or well, I'm still coming halfway, my foot is in a marriage and my foot is outside. And when you have two feet, not both feet is in, it's like you come to the Islam fully. 
you know, and, and did we come to Islam and marriage fully or we're just coming halfway, you know, and we're still, you know, following our hawa and our this. And I think, to me personally, my humble opinion to this subject, how do we come to the marriage uh, and coming to the marriage, how you choose first the, the marriage, you know, how you choose a husband and wife, and that's a different, you know, another topic, but I just want to address the concern of, of uh, you know, today, you know, the foundation of our communities, it is the family. And the foundation of all this, it is Imara Asaliha, the righteous wife. And a righteous husband. And a righteous husband. No. You know, if we don't have a righteous wife and we, you know, and you have a righteous husband, it's not going to work. And if you have a, a, a you know, a righteous wife and there's no righteous husband, it's not going to work. That's why we have to come fully as the Muslims, you know, with, with the attitude that is an amana. And it is this, this relationship, it is to please Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And I think if we start, you know, how, what, what would we do, as they say, you know, would be, uh, uh, I forgot the term when I used to work for the company, um, you know, people would come to you because you, you know, the guy who makes the decision. And subhanAllah, when people used to come to me, I used to have to go through the process of, before you come to an action plan, you go through the process, understand the problem. You brainstorm? And, yeah, you brainstorm the session, you know, you go back and forth with that manager, with that, those employees, and then you say, okay, what do you think is the action plan? I don't believe in ever convincing a person. Because if you convince someone into anything, sooner or later, he's going to find himself that, you know, I should not have done that decision. So that's why when we submit to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we submit as a Muslim. Um, Jazakallah khairan. You know, your point is valid. The reason I would say um, this point of the foundation of a marriage and what the marriage is built on, I think that topic specifically should be, I mean, I am going to I'm going to talk about it um, suddenly or very briefly, but that topic also needs a lecture called marriage. Um, because right now, in this case, what about the families that are already married and have been married for years and they're having these problems? Are we going to make them rethink about the decision that they've made? No, no. Sorry if I'm interrupting you. No, I don't think we should. But in this brainstorming session, for people who are not married, or people who are already divorced, who have sister by themselves, who have, who have children and they are struggling, who have brother by themselves, also who have children, their mother doesn't want nothing to do with them. We have all the scenarios. And to be fair to the whole subject, we shouldn't just talk about one scenario. So we don't say that we are cited. You know, and we're biased in our things. You know, we, we here as a servant of Allah to bring the, the problems forward. And we hope that anybody who is listening maybe might do better than us in, in coming to a solution. This is how we should always think. Because sometimes somebody might be listening and we don't have a connection to him, but might take this and come up with a better plan. But what I'm saying is that, you know, the foundation of a marriage, even if you marriage and you're struggling, if you go back to the root, of the problem, let's say, this is how the foundation of my marriage, you know, let's say you have structure in the house, you know, and that structure started to give up, and you know that house is going to fall down, but you find the problem, it is this side of the house, the structure is going to come down, you have to, you know, you know, uh, straighten the foundation. So what you do, you put temporary, you know, beams to lift that house up, and you go back and you refix that foundation, and then you, you drop everything on it again, and it stands solid. So if, if we, the parents, are not following Islam, are not doing, I cannot fix the father, you know, the son and say, I take you to a Friday or to a Sunday school, and when you ask me, it happened to me. And the son told me, my father doesn't make salat, and he wants me to make salat. I mean, th th this is what I'm trying to tell you, uh, you know, because the father tell me, what do you say to my son to make salat? And the son answered, he said, my father does not make salat, and he's yelling at me. And I said, your, your father loves you. And by you doing that, you're helping him, you know, to come to it too. You the light, you know. You know, and I looked at the father, like, you know, in my mind. Like shame on you? <laughs> no, not shame. What is stopping you? How could I help you? You know, I, I don't want to shame anyone because that could be me also. I'm just saying you should find a way to approach the subject differently. You know, so I think that what I'm trying to say is that if people are having a problem with their marriages, there is a way to fix it. As long as they have intention, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the divorce is a lot of result, you know. 
when we come even to the divorce, we should not become nasty and destroy your children and one put on this side and one put on that side and becomes this bouncing ball. And then we ask for solution for everything in our life. As long as we use the Quran and the Sunnah, we will find solution to them. So, the ball is in your court, my dear. Taib, Bizakallah khairan. When it comes to marriage, as we discussed, which is the, the foundation of a family, it starts out with the marriage. And the Prophet وسلم, he gave us guidance when it comes to marriage. He says in Hadith والسلام, describing a righteous spouse from like a male. That if a man comes to you that you accept and respect his religion, his deen, and his akhlaq, then do not look for anything else. Wealth can fade away. Finances can fall and change. Positions in this dunya can be removed and be changed. All of that can go away. Health. He can be sick within a year or two and he'll be destroyed. All of that can happen, but if he's a person of good deed and good akhlaq, that household will remain together. And subhanAllah, each and every one of us wishes and wants to have that spouse that will stand with him through thick and, thi and thin. You know, tooth and nail. You know, through sickness and health, wealth and poverty. Until death do us part. That's what we all wish. But today, subhanAllah, because the foundations are built wrong, the expectations are wrong, you find a spouse who when her husband loses her job and, and they're struggling financially, she just cannot bear it for too long and she wants to up and leave. And vice versa. You know, it happens from the man's side as well when he has certain expectations that he comes into the marriage with and they're not there. He falls apart or he breaks the family down and he starts to look for other alternatives and problems happen. That's why with, when it comes to the man, look for that person that you will accept and admire his deen and his akhlaq. Now for the woman, yes, he says in the hadith, تُنْكَحَ الْمُرْأَةُ لِأَرْبَعٍ that you can you can find a spouse and marry her if you admire her wealth. Not that you're a gold digger, but she can be wealthy, and you you find that appealing. For me specifically, it doesn't matter. I want someone that I can that will respect me and respect you. You come poor, you come wealthy, you come middle class. It doesn't matter. I want someone that will respect me and I will respect sure. you in return. Sure. Comes from a good family because you're also marrying. Not only the woman, but you're married the entire family. Unless she has this connection between her family, so that's a different story. Li um, her her beauty. And honestly, as much as you find some of the imams, they tell you, just strictly focus on the deed and sacrifice the rest, I disagree with that. From well, a personal I, I perspective. agree with you, I agree with you. And I'm going to go to that point in a second. Yes, yes, yes. I agree with you. The deen, yes. The Prophet ﷺ mentioned that the most important factor is the deen. It's also hadith, I think, that says that if you look at her, she should... The surah ainuk. The surah ainuk, yes. And I'm going to mention that in a second as well. Yeah. And he also mentioned, as Allah ﷺ said, dunya mata' wa khayru mata' dunya imratun saliha. This dunya is all about pleasure. And the best pleasure you can gain in this world is a righteous spouse. And also I think there is the hasanat of dunya imratun saliha. So there's, there's a hadith that talk about the righteous wife and how you should focus on a righteous wife. But you also need, in today's time, and I say this for men now, you need to also find a spouse that you will admire her beauty. That's true. That's true. In America, since we're talking about the West, you will always find that beautiful woman out there at work, on the street, at the supermarket, in the parking lot, you will find them. There's, I'm sorry to say, to use this, this ghetto expression, but there is plenty of fish in the sea. You will always find yeah. that beautiful woman. I hope I'm sorry. Come on, brother. Exactly. 
You have to lower <laughs> your gaze. <laughs> Look at that, the fruit and the vegetables. <laughs> this is a beautiful watermelon. This is beautiful tomatoes. This is a beautiful... Absolutely. You know, but you let me tell you this. Break on yourself, brother. Even though we are required to lower our gaze, I am telling you, being realistically speaking, it's not as easy. I understand. I and understand. with that being said, if you don't have a spouse that is so beautiful that you are honestly, you know, admiring her beauty even while you are away thinking about her, you will definitely fall into the haram whether it's cheating or flirting or talking to this person or talking to that person. And that's how families and marriages, I mean, it's, it's unfortunate. You know, men, the way we are created, the way our, our bodies built, we're just animals, wild animals sometimes. We're just never satisfied. And I'm sure that the sister is right now. I'm sure that the sister is right now. I'm like, yes, the chef is right. But at the same time, it goes both ways. It honestly goes both ways because sisters are emotional. Now, I, I, I gave the men their part, their piece about being unsatisfied sometimes. But sisters, sometimes they're emotional. And they may find that co-worker at work. And it happens. Or, you know, their friend who's a male which shouldn't have happened in the first place, that's when they're arguing with their husband, their spouse, they're fighting, they're not talking. Some sisters tend to vent to that coworker, to that friend. And trust me, that man, at the moment, will listen respectfully, be all ears, make you feel that you're the most important person in the world. You're thinking, wow, why isn't my husband the same way? This guy listens to me, respects me. Sister, do not fool yourself. I, I can make that a, brother I, has one objective and one objective only. I I, I want to make a go ahead. You know, you sometimes you might not even have the objective because it happened to me. I was a director of a company. And somebody of the employees who have you know women at work and women in the management team and sometimes you see that she's coming, she's all there and you wanna tell her to take the day off, but sometimes they come in from somewhere, they don't wanna go back home. So you bring it to the office, you sit down and you listen attentively. But your concern is her well-being. You have no remorse, you have nothing in your mind. But she finds that thing in you that she's not finding home. Yes. Especially if they know that you're a person of integrity, you're a person who, who well-respected, you know, especially in your job, in your, you know, the, you, their eyes start looking at you. But you have also, when you even given counseling with the men on the other side, you have to put hudud Allah, you have to put the boundaries of Allah and guide that sister, if she's a Muslim or not Muslim, to the right thing. And even if she thinks, and I had seen some of people that work for me, she fell on to, 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 to haram and I was trying to save her from it. I said, do not go out with a co-worker you know, to the bar or to this, please listen to me. You know, take time out, go through the process before you rush into something that you think is going to solve you know, to, to, to put a band-aid on your emotion and you have that, 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 that foggy happiness for that moment and before that you're going to feel so sorry. This has happened to me also when I went in to use, I used to go for my company solving problem and I used to listen to some of the management team and you can see people always, add, you know, carry pain with them from some challenges and a lot of times this situation, as you said, it happens at work, you know, it, you know, and, and, Sometimes is a man talking to even a woman and she has his eye on her. It would happen either way. So if we as a Muslim, we have to put those boundaries of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We have to make sure, you know, especially that... You no, know, absolutely. Are, I, I, I agree know. with that point and, um, very well. And um, I, I, I would say, let me take back my statement of, um, you know, that person will have one objective. Not all the time, but for the most part or a lot of times... Yes, you know, yes. They may have some type of connection towards you. But if he's a person that feels a loss of panel data, then no. Yes, he may want your well being. However, I want to give one quick hadith to talk to, to, to just focus on the aspect before we wrap up and start taking questions. Te that teaches us a great lesson when it comes to family disputes. Fatima, the daughter of the Prophet. She goes into a disagreement with, with her husband, Ali ibn Talib. Ali ibn Talib is the cousin of Prophet the husband of, of Fatima. Fatima is the daughter of the, of the Prophet And what happened, they argue, Ali ibn Talib leaves the house and goes to the masjid. 
the Prophet comes to to Fatima to visit his, his daughter between Luhan and Asr while it's a time of Qaylula and he finds Ali not there. So he asks Fatima, Qala Aidam Dahumaki, where's your cousin? And he wanted to say that he didn't say where's your husband, he didn't say where's Ali. He brought that up because he wanted to explain to her that there is Salat Qaraba, there is yes, blood yes. involved before the marriage. Yes. Look at him as family before you look at him as a husband. And he said, Laqad waqa abilana shay. We had a, dis a dispute, a disagreement, and he left. The Prophet immediately he respected his boundaries, the boundaries and he left as well. He went to the masjid. What we learned from this, and of course he went to the masjid, Fala Ali sleeping in, in, in the ground, in the sand, he was covered in sand, and he, he went to him gently and wiped the sand off of his shoulder and says, Qum Aba Tarab, Qum Aba Tarab. This small hadith teaches us that Fatima, her father, the Prophet, one, Muhammad was her father, and was the messenger of Allah, and was a judge, and was a counselor. She had four reasons to talk to him about her family dispute and tell him what happened between her and Ali. But she understood that what happens inside those four walls stays in those four walls. Not even her father or the Messenger of Allah should know about it unless it's extremely necessary. The Prophet also respected the fact that his daughter wanted to keep that privacy and didn't ask her, well, no, what happened? I'm going to go talk to him, I'm going to you know, do this or oh, that. Unfortunately, that's how we're going to... That's our, our families. Yeah, I've been and the mothers are coming, you know, that person, I told you he was a bad person, why is he doing this? No. He didn't say nothing. He understood that this was an internal dispute. He did not want to get involved. She did not want to share much details. He kept it at that. He didn't go to Ali and say, why did you hurt my daughter's feelings? He went respectfully and woke him up with gentleness and smooth, respectfully, kum, kum abat, with the kunya. And a kunya is a sign of respect. Qum aba turab, qum aba turab. We learn from the sisters and brothers. You will argue with your spouse. Without a doubt. But it doesn't mean that you go tell your mother, your father, your brother, your sister, the entire neighborhood. No one needs to know about it. Add the social media today. Fadal. No, I said, wait, unfortunately people add the social media today. Oh yes, add the social media, absolutely. Facebook, call, add the social they, media. They call strangers that they have nobody just because they connected with them. And those people sound so good, they think that they are their savior, which is many no, cases. Man, what not. happens in the family stays in the household unless it's a matter of divorce and very serious. And at that point, it does not go to social media, it does not go to the entire neighborhood. Who does it go to? One wise person from her side, and one wise person from her, from her side. If they truly want to resolve this, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will resolve that dispute between them. Ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to rectify our families and save our families from issues. We will open the, 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 the session for the next five or seven minutes um, or six minutes until 9.30 for anyone who has any questions from Clubhouse, Facebook. Please share or type your question if you have any questions that you want us to talk about in disagreements. Remember, today's talk between me and Abdullah wasn't really matter of, you know, Quran and Sunnah and strictly got, this was, you know, a, a formal chat that him and I had, discussion, we both shared and voiced our opinions on certain topics. I know some things that I may have said or he may have said, some of you may disagree with or have a better approach to it. So if you do, please, this is an open discussion today to hear people's thoughts and we will definitely have a round two and round three for this topic. If anyone has a topic or a concern about this matter, please share any questions or um, thoughts that you may have. I want to see if um, any questions came from here on the Facebook and then also from the, from our the brothers and the brothers and sisters who are with us. You know, you're more than welcome uh, to ask any question. We're here just to learn again from you and share how could we better serve ourselves and our communities and our families. Uh, the reason we're talking about this subject tonight it is because of the challenges that we see in the community. And sometimes, you know, we see these challenges that it could be avoided if we just invested more time, more understanding, and, uh, and patience in how to come to the problem. You know, we, the, for every problem there is a solution. If you don't find a solution, Allah has put other things, you know. 
and how to deal with it. You know, um, it could be divorce, it could be separation, but those things has to be also done in pleasing Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and no harm done to either person. Um, Think about that speaker, Adia. Okay. Um, I had a question, um, uh, brother, um, I'm Muhammad and brother, I forgot, I'm sorry, your name. Yes, sir. So, uh, the issue of uh, families who are already established, we know we live in a non-Muslim society and we do have um, nuclear families or sometimes some of the sisters or brothers, they come from non-Muslim families. Um, so it means they do not have somebody who is aware of Islamic rights and uh, uh, you know rights and obligations of um, Muslim spouse. And in that sense, who would be? I mean, would the imam be the person that they would go to and share their um, you know dispute, or who would be the closest person who would like basically be unbiased and give them guidance? Uh, yes, can also, Sheikh yes, Yasser can go on this. You know, um, it's the Imam in the community and that Imam has to have, you know, understanding real well, not to come from an approach of, you know, uh, the cultural approach or how we deal with issues back home. You really should have a way how the family challenges is being dealt in America and have, understand his community so he can approach it in a way that is fair and just, you know. And, and one thing that I always advise anyone because I got a lot of this gold, you know, a lot of time you don't know what goes in the houses, you know, so you only listen. And your goal is to, you know, to be fair and just because right now, if you take anybody's side, the wizard, it's very dangerous when you meet Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So, you know, for me personally, when I get this gold, I listen always to both parties. If the wife come, I listen to her. You know, she calls about the phone, I give her, you know, and then I said, I would like to reach out to your husband. You know, we try to reach out, sometimes husband doesn't want to answer. You know, you give it time. If, if the situation is difficult, then we make a decision that is appropriate to feel to protection of that family uh, and, and that. And most of the imam in here, in the DMV area, alhamdulillah, many of them that I know, they really are, you know, they try very, very hard because understand also the imam does not have any authority you know, to make any, 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 any uh, push to anyone to accept any decision, accept, you know, their free will, that they are willing to do that by pleasing Allah, and they both feel Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So the Imam would be the right person to go to. Um, unless you know some elderly people in the community that you know, you know, uh, you know, that could help. But a lot of time, I believe the Imam is the best one to go back to. Inshallah. I agree hundred percent, nothing more to say. Um Deepa, did you um did you wanna say something? Yeah, yeah I had a question. Sakalaka salam alaikum. Mashallah, what a wonderful topic, that's not much needed. And um the question that I had was when a sister comes to you and um share with you um family problems <laughs> and you advise her to go to the iman you know but at the same time they're not you know comfortable going to the iman and um what is the right thing to to advise because you you don't want to say something you know um so what what is the another alternative you can think of. Well, sister, alhamdulillah, as I said, you know, I I am here leader of uh, the community and I'm president of nonprofit and I've been involved in the community. People take me as a role as a leader, as an imam, which uh, it's not, it, the imam should, you know, should be able, if you have issues and reservation about the imam, then we, we, we must find somebody who is a leader in your community, who has been respected by you and, and, and your husband and trustworthy. And you know that when you go into him, he's not taking sides. Any imam that takes sides, or he's not being fair, and he, he needs to go and review to his behavior because this is very serious in the eye of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. When two people come to you, either in marriage or in any situation, you take sides, 
the weather of it is very, very dangerous. It's, 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 a, it's a type of dom, you know, type of transgression, trap type of, of, of oppression. It's very dangerous, you know, and I urge my, my brothers, imams, and, and the leaders in the community to take these things seriously because the reason of this topic is about this, you know, what could we do? So I, I believe and I strongly believe that you should, if the imam is not qualified, or you believe his bias, 